Well, hello, writers, and welcome to episode number 471 of Ink in Your Veins. I'm Rachel Heron, and I'm so pleased that you are here with me today as I am with Julie Leong, who wrote a book I loved. You are going to hear me talk about this book, The Teller of Small Fortunes, which you should go out and buy right now. It is really that good, especially in a week where you may be feeling stress or tension, perhaps, as a vote crests in the United States and the whole world is watching. Uh, the Teller of Small Fortunes is what you want to read. It really, really is. So please stick around for my incredibly delightful conversation with her. I am so excited I got to read this book early and you are going to love it. What has been going on around here before we jump into the interview? Um, well, in big news, finally news, oh my goodness, Unstuck, my most recent memoir, is available everywhere for the first time. I can say that. It's just taken a while to get up on all of the different platforms and vendors and it is finally there. You can order it from your independent bookstore. You can order it at your local library. You can order it all around the world. You can get it from Audible. If you have Audible credits, you can get it from any of the other audio vendors. You can get it from any online digital retailer. You can get it in paperback anywhere you like. It is out there. It's also available on my website. Um, that's actually, if you want to read Unstuck, which I'm really, really proud of, it is about moving to New Zealand and about getting unstuck after you feel kind of stuck in your life. Uh, the best way to send the most money to me and not to one of the retailers is to go to rachelheronbooks.com and you can get the paperback or the audiobook or the ebook right from there. However, I love, respect, worship all of the other vendors as well, especially your local library. My gosh, even if you did get the book, especially if you did get the book and you liked it, you could still order it at your library and then it would be available for other people to read for free. And that is a, that's one of the, right up there with, I'm trying to decide which is better, leaving a review or ordering it at your local library. Oh, I don't know which I love more. They're both Pro they're the two most helpful things you can do for an author that you care about. Review their book on Amazon or Goodreads. And I know Amazon, blah, but it does really help um, with discoverability and order their book at your local library. You can do, I do it on my phone. I have the Libby app. Boop. I found the book that I want. And I say something like, it used to say request this book, but now it says notify me if my library gets this. But then they go out and get the book. It's especially if multiple people request it. Uh, but I belong to a couple of libraries on Libby, maybe maybe more than two, uh, all legally, of course. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of them I'm thinking of in particular, I, I request it and they get it for me. It is the best. The author gets paid and also it gets into their collection for other people to read. It's the best. So I'm going to um, encourage you to do that. What else is going on today? I started my new book. I'm just going to call it the ephemera book from now on because it's, if I can manage to pull it off, I'm writing it in ephemera of all sorts. I don't know if I can pull that off. And I'm sure the the uh, working title, it's not even a working title. It's like a working handle. But I started it today. I didn't mean to. I've been waiting for the right moment. I've been waiting to know a little bit more about the book. And, oh, I'll tell you about this. Let me see if I can find it. Uh here we go. I have this little writing exercise that I do with classes sometimes, or I do it in retreat sometimes. And I did this yesterday and I heard something really interesting from this exercise. In this exercise, I ask you, I'm going to just ask you to do this if you want to. What you do is you talk to your writing as if it is the kindest friend you have ever had. And you write out the conversation between the two of you. You ask writing the questions and writing answers you more lovingly than anyone has ever loved you. Writing is the kindest friend you will ever have. And you, I never get tired of doing this exercise. It always surprises me. Everyone is always a little bit gobsmacked and blown away by this exercise. And yesterday in class, I while, while I was doing this with students, um, I told writing that I just wasn't sure if I was a good enough writer to pull this particular book off. I don't even know what I want to put in it. And 
writing told me, uh, you don't know anything. You don't need, sorry, you don't need to know anything. I don't know anything. That is the truth. And writing said, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to know anything. You don't need to prepare. You just show up and start writing and writing will take care of it. I just show up and move my fingers. And it was the most beautiful, loving, lovely little conversation uh, that I was having with writing. And this morning I was reading my book during my reading time. And I sat down the book and I grabbed my Remarkable and I just started writing. And I got uh, almost 1,200 words without thinking. And I haven't broken the book yet. I will break the book. The book is still perfect. The book is so perfect. It's so beautiful. I have no idea what it is. And by writing a book, you break the book you think you want the book to be. And in revising the book, you find out what the book was supposed to be. And I will end up with a broken mess. And you will hear me talk about this book as if I, it's just the the biggest clumps of non-understandable things and I'll be frustrated and that's coming and that's normal. But right now it's still beautiful. And I really loved writing those first few words. It was so, so, so fun. And that's because I had a little, a little chat with writing yesterday. So if you've never done that, if you have never chatted with your writing as if it is a a person, a being, where you're writing both sides of the conversation, just go ask writing some questions. And I would love to hear from you if you do this and and find out what you were surprised by. Um what else? I sent my Patreon out this morning. It was about writing. And if you're on my Patreon, then you got that. It was about finishing books and revis- revisions and how many revisions books take and and the state of all of the books that are in the air and need to be brought to the ground and landing these planes. And I have been landing planes uh, this year. So that feels good. That Patreon essay went out. You can always join over there, patreon.com slash Rachel for a buck a month and read all of the essays. You can pay $1 read, I don't know, 50 or 60, maybe 70 essays. It would be a lot of reading, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of words if you wanted to. And then you could duck out and you get all that done in a month for a dollar if you wanted to. Or you could just go read that essay about, uh, or that uh, it's more of a newsletter about writing. That's over there at Patreon. And um, that's enough talk about writing. I am still catching up from those, uh, that two day migraine last week. I am really, I was really behind. I was really feeling behind and I'm still behind. I'm almost caught up and I am also trying to be kind to myself and not overwork and myself into another migraine. So on that note, I will give you Julie's bio and oh my God, you're going to love this and you need this book. You really need this book. Uh, Julie Leong is a Chinese Malaysian American fantasy author who grew up across both New Jersey and Beijing, China. She studied economics and political science at Yale and works in tech, but she has always nurtured a deep love for science fiction fantasy beneath the corporate her corporate exterior. Julie lives in San Francisco with her husband, their rescue pup, and a magical Meyer lemon tree in the backyard that somehow always has ripe lemons. While she's not writing, she enjoys making unnecessary spreadsheets and flambéing things. The Teller of Small Fortunes is her debut novel. You're going to love it. You're going to love this whole interview. Here we go. I'm so glad you're here. Well, I'm so pleased to welcome you to the show. Will you please share your name and pronouns with us? Yes. Thank you, Rachel. My name is Julie Leong and my pronouns are she, her. I am delighted to have you. I was telling you a little bit before we started that I I get a lot of books from publicists and my my here's my series of actions that I take when I get public because I get publicists um, pitching their people with their books to me every day, all day. And I look at it and if it grabs me, I say, yes, send me a net galley. And then, um, and if it if it's really something cool, I'll say, yes, let's get them on the podcast calendar. And then I try to read the books, but I'm always reading all the other books too. So it just doesn't happen a lot of times. But yours, for some reason, I was, I saw it. I think I wasn't feeling well on a day and I thought, well, this looks, this looks lovely. I'll just try it. And I could not put it down. Oh. It was, let me just, I will fangirl for just one moment here. It was not only exactly what I wanted to read from beginning to end. I did not want it to end. And I have been, 
annoyed several times already because some people have said, well, what have you read lately? What have you loved? And I will start to say your book and then it's not out yet. So I've been told, <laughs> I have told people about it anyway, but by the time this show comes out, it will be out and people must go buy this. It is the feel good, lovely book of the year. And I just couldn't get enough of it. I And, I, and I was irritated after it was done because then I couldn't get this, the feeling back. I've been looking for the feeling. <laughs> That is extremely kind of you. Thank it's you, Rachel. Kind and true. I will say, Let's, I do think it is probably yeah. a good sick day book. So yeah. It, it was like a, a perfect sick day book. Yes, it really, <laughs> tr- it truly, truly was. And I've been looking to recapture that feeling. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about, well, actually, before we get into the writing process, this is your debut novel, correct? It is. Yeah. And it comes out in November, I want to say. November November 5th, Election Day, unfortunately. Oh, fabulous. Great. Yeah. Well, that'll be a great day to have this book come out. And honestly, one, it'll, hope. it'll, it'll yeah. one, one hopes it, we will not need it to recover. We will just need it to celebrate. Uh, that's yes, what we're yes. hoping. That's, that's what we're hoping for. My, my vote has been sent over over the over the transom. Um, <laughs> how is it feeling, though, as a, so the, it will be out by the time uh, this podcast go live, but oh, goes live. Right. But how are you feeling right now about being a debut author? And it's coming out in two weeks. Oh goodness, I have so many feelings um, that it's hard to kind of untangle them and identify them yeah. individually. But definitely a lot of excitement in there. Probably you know a smidge or two of of anxiety, but I think that's to be expected. And some of that again is probably election, or it's definitely election related. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. But I can't imagine whole, having that all. Like all wrapped up together, the election and your book. Yeah, it's actually also the day after my birthday, um, which I actually forgot about until like a week ago and my husband reminded me. So that gives you some sense of kind of where my brain's at. Yeah, no, a whole lot of feelings, many good, some bad. But on the whole, when I think about the book, I think the journey that I've had so far and everything I've had in this introduction publishing, probably the predominant emotion here is gratitude. I've Mm -hmm. never in my life, you know, expected to be where I am with the a book coming out that's like made of paper and people are holding it in their hands and liking it occasionally. Um, And they read by choice because they want to, because this is what they're looking for. Yeah. Well, people will tell their friends. My publicist throws it at them. (laughs) (laughs) But then people, yeah. yeah. But then people like me go out and tell other people about it. And I just think that's Mm -hmm. the most exciting thing. Do you have any um, publicity lined up? Do you, are you doing any like public signings? Are you doing anything like that? Are you having a a launch party? Very very mini book tour. Tour is much too grandiose a word for it. Um, I'm doing a launch party here in San Francisco where I live um, with a number of friends and family coming to eat some cake and hear me talk about the book. And then we're doing one in San Diego as well um, a couple of days after that. And then I'm very excited. I'm actually going to the UK to do a mini tour as well because I have a UK publisher. Oh, and so fun. I'll be doing events. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm doing events in London, Liverpool, and Edinburgh, which makes me feel very fancy indeed. Oh, just enjoy that. Just enjoy every oh, single moment of that. That is so, 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 so fun. Mm-hmm. And I can... I. Just please take me at my word. I can predict that people are going to love this. They are, oh, I, they, thank you. Mm. Okay, Fingers let's talk crossed. about your writing process. Sure. Can you tell us um, when, where, how do you do it? Where does it fit in your life? How do you get your writing done? Yeah, absolutely. So when I write, let's see, how do I put this? I basically turn into a cave troll in many sense. I, I like retreat into a dark, cozy room with just me and my dog. And I go into a fugue state and do nothing but write and eat and drink and sleep for, you know, as many weeks as it takes to come up with a workable draft. And then I reemerge blinking into the light and asking what day of the week it is. Um, or at least that's how it's gone for the few manuscripts that I've produced thus far, uh, which yeah. I think there are three of them now. So you um, are kind of a binge writer, as they say. That. I am you go, indeed you go a in writer. and Yeah. Yeah. My, my partner says he's never seen me so focused or non-responsive as when I'm <laughs> over my laptop writing. Um, and not noticing the world around me. I I will say, though, there's a ton of privilege in that statement. I know a lot of writers have to squeeze their writing into, you know, 15 minutes here or there, before or after work, you know, in the car, uh, picking up the kids at school, that kind of thing. But I have a bit of a unique situation right now that I think has led to this being my writing cave system, um, which is that all of my books that I've written, I've produced while I was taking a break from my other career. So I wasn't actually working during any of the times when I produced any of these manuscripts. I've just been, um, well, I mean, the first time I quit my job because my father was quite ill. And so I was spending a lot of time at the hospital or at home waiting to go to the hospital. And that's kind of what led to all of this. Um, 
he's doing better now, thankfully. Oh, he's good. in remission, um, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. But yeah, I, I recognize that, you know, not having dependents other than a very needy cockapoo and a <laughs> relatively low maintenance husband, like these <laughs> things enable me to do these writing binges. And it's probably not the case for most other people. Um, but I do them generally at home. So here, this is one of my writing spaces, although sometimes I'll move to like the squishy armchair over there. It's very non-ergonomic though. So my physical therapist doesn't like that. And I've been trying to do the keyboard and monitor thing more. I, uh, I have I have my um, physiotherapist here in New Zealand, like oh, yeah? absolutely approved my recliner oh. because it's supporting oh. my neck and like I've got my hands and my arms are supported. And I was like, you're not supposed to say that. He's like, no, this, it, looks, <laughs> it looks like a great setup for you. So well, it sounds like you're doing it right. I'm kind of much more hunched in like you know, <laughs> goblin-esque position. So. Maybe not the best. But <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do a binge draft and then, you know, I will take a break away from the manuscript once that has kind of come into being and then give myself some fresh eyes after a little bit of time away, go back to it and begin the long dreaded, ugly process of revising and, you know, carving it into shape. <laughs> That's awesome. I also really like it when people talk about being a binge writer because it mm -hmm. is a method. There are people who try to beat themselves up about, well, I'm not writing for, you know, 30 minutes mm -hmm. a day, every day of my life. And I just don't know how to do that. Some people mm -hmm. don't need to do that. Some people are binge writers or some people are binge writers for a while and then they do other things and it's a yeah. valid system when it works for the person it works for it went i will right. i will caution i will caution listeners it doesn't work for you if you never do it if you think that's <laughs> your way and you never get around to doing it then it's not your method but using it is that's fantastic what is the most exciting thing you've ever realized about your writing process hmm I think one of them here is that I don't actually have to be writing to be writing, if that makes any Ooh, sense. Tell me more. Um, I mean, so it feels really productive to open up the Google Doc and then, you know, look up four hours later and check my word count and see that it's grown by several thousand. That's great. But I also found that um, some of the most progress that I made on my manuscripts would be when I was not in front of my laptop mm. turning out words. It might be in the, I have a lot of shower thoughts. I don't know if this is a thing with everyone <laughs> else, but maybe that's one benefit of the binge writing method, which is that you're just constantly thinking mm. about your manuscript because it's so fresh and living in your mind and you're constantly you know, putting out new words and thinking about what's coming next or thinking about the words that you already wrote that day. And so just because your mind is consciously already working through it, sometimes I'll have these unexpected kind of epiphanies or, you know, a uh, realization about where the plot needs to go, or actually I need to change that scene in this way. And I'll be doing something completely different, like cooking rice or about to go to bed or toweling my hair dry. And then I, I you know, immediately have to grab my phone and jot down some cryptic phrase or keyword to jog my memory the next day. And sometimes it's too cryptic because I'm like, what did I mean by this? <laughs> but some, most of the time I will remember what I meant. Um, and then I will have kind of something to start with next time I open that blank Google doc, I will search out the area I meant to be, you know, adding something to and start transcribing the the strange thoughts from earlier. Um, because on. your brain is doing that heavy lifting in the background while, exactly. while yeah. you are so immersed. And I believe that's true. Even if people are just touching their manuscript, you know, for 30 minutes uh, on their writing days, as long right. as we keep ourselves close to it, our, our subconscious is always doing a lot of heavy lifting that we don't have to ask it to do. I think that's I, right. I, yeah, yeah. Go on. I was just going to say, it reminds me a little bit of when I was really young and I had a big test and the next day I would do the silly thing and like take my notes and put them under my pillow and sleep on them and like imagine them seeping into my brain through osmosis. It's kind of like that, but with, with the book that you're writing. How beautiful that you did that because it was actually happening. You did it. You, you probably didn't know that as a kid, but you were assimilating <laughs> all of those things that we look at right before we go to sleep. The brain is doing all that sorting, collating, storing. Um, that's, that's beautiful. May I ask you, have you ever heard of, um, Aqua notes? I have not. Is this a this, software? This maybe this, no, it's even better. It's a, it's a very much a non-software thing. Uh, maybe something that you need to go buy after this. It is a pad of paper and a pencil that you hang in the shower oh. and it's meant to be written on while wet and you could just tear the paper off and just take it out with you. I love it. It's that so brilliant. Good. I'm going to Google that. As soon as we get off. It works. It's fabulous. The pay the it's, it's I don't know how it works. It's brilliant. So there you go. That sounds much better than my sticking a wet hand outside of the shower to grab my phone and then texting without looking at the screen. Plus, your husband will be able to leave you notes. 
And I, oh, I can't yeah. guarantee that they're all going to be like <laughs> non dirty, but uh, that's the notes that I would, I would get in and I'd have really deep thoughts about my book and I'd get in uh -huh. and I'd find a dirty picture for my wife, but you know, <laughs> everybody, <laughs> it's fun for the whole family. It's, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> exactly. What part of writing do you struggle with the most? Hmm. Uh, there, I mean, there are several, let's, let's be honest, but if I had narrowed down to a couple, I'm not great at action scenes. Um, my, my instinct is to kind of blur over them. I'm, I'm very much about the kind of the character work instead. And so I'm about like the quiet moments around the campfire mm -hmm. and the conversations. And so if I ever had to write like a, a really large battle scene, I think I would be utterly lost. And I do have some action scenes in my in my um, books, but they're like relatively small scale. And so I can muddle my way through. But in all of my manuscripts, all of the action scenes start as like a bullet bracketed <laughs> holder of like, and everything happened all at once. And like, you know, <laughs> fight here. And then I have yeah. to eventually go back in and painstakingly work through the action beats and so on, because it just doesn't feel very natural to me. Mm -hmm. um yeah so I, I would say action scenes definitely something I need to I need to get better at or I could just stop writing action I guess and <laughs> stories that stay very still in one room I, I, even though you say that like I'm I'm looking at your book in my head and just seeing that the the times that I really was even you know the most invested in the book were the campfire scenes the sitting mm -hmm. around the emotional connections the mm -hmm. um so you know we all we all have our yeah have our strengths and we play to those. So speaking of I have strengths, one other. Oh, oh yes, please. I just please. thought of another thing that I could work on as well. I'm a very impatient person. And so mm -hmm. I find in manuscripts that I've drafted, as I'm getting toward the end, I rush to get there because I just want to be done. And so my endings are always classically underbaked. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just, just chop that out. There. It feels like you're, you know, skiing and suddenly the, like it just gets steeper and steeper and the faster you're just going so fast and you know, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be going that fast. And then you're there and it'll crap now right. I gotta go it's fix like, it it's like if yeah. you've ever seen the meme of a drawing of a horse and like the first two-thirds <laughs> of the horse are incredibly detailed and realized and then the rest is like a stick figurehead yeah that's that's kind of what my first drafts look like <laughs> that is exactly what mine do as well especially toward the ending which I I never even usually know my endings I usually I usually roll my way down the hill as fast as possible till about like 92 percent mm. and then I just stop I'm just no yeah. or you no, hope that the inertia of the story carries you <laughs> yeah no I've exactly. Exactly. So what are you really good at writing wise? Mm -hmm. This is um, an awkward question for those who aren't. I know yourself. that's yeah, but... why I like to push it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll give two answers. One, I think the answers tend to be a bit more writing craft focus. And so, you know, in the same way that I'm bad at action scenes and bad at first draft endings, I think there's um, I'm one thing I'm good at relating to kind of the structure of the story but the other slightly wild card answer, but I do think it's really important, and I do think it's actually something I'm like uniquely good at, is I read so much. I read constantly, and I read very, very, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So I can actually get through a ton of books in a relatively short amount of time. And the reason why I think this is a writing thing to brag about is because like I said before, I do think that reading is also another thing that's not writing that is actually writing when you look under the hood. Um, yes. The Teller of Small Fortunes was the first book that I've ever written, actually the first thing I've ever tried to write. And I think part of the reason why I was able to do that is because I read so much for so long. Um, and it's a little bit like osmosis, again, where you know we are the product of everything that we've experienced and my writing is the product of everything I've ever read. And so the ability to kind of ingest all of this new work um, from other authors to subconsciously, you know, learn from the shape of the story and how it feels in your brain and so on um, is something that I think was a huge advantage for me in terms of my, my starting point. I think it's also helpful because, um, you know, there's, there's just every, something to be learned from every kind of book. And so if I read widely across a lot of different genres, even though I only write fantasy, you know, I, I love reading cozy mysteries and all kinds of other things, historical fiction. And so you can kind of borrow the best of all these other genres and bring them into the stories that you're telling in fantasy. So I, I read a lot. I read very quickly. I think that's a very important one. I am I am the same. And I think even if we're not consciously doing it, because sometimes I, I beat myself up from not consciously learning from every book I'm reading, <laughs> but I think we are learning from every single book that we're reading and we are bringing in the best when we can do it. And I am also a fast reader, except mm -hmm. when... 
I get stumped by, I realize I have just fallen for something or fallen into something or fallen in love with something in the writing. Mm -hmm. And then I will go back and I'm like, how do they do it? I don't make my notes. I'm not, I'm not careful like that, but I, I will mm -hmm. reread a page or two a few times mm -hmm. to try to figure out how that, how that magic just happened. So yeah. that is, that is, yeah. that's absolutely perfect. And then what? I guess the, yeah, the craft related strength, because I, yes. I was going to give you one of each. Um, I think like you were mentioning before the campfire scenes, I, I like writing those a lot and I feel like that comes through in how they read. So, you know, having a kind of emotional moment for the characters that you've come to care about that feels earned um, is, is something that I like to think is a strength of mine. So how do you do that for somebody? I, I really like that you added there that um, the emotional moment that feels earned is this something that you do in a first draft? Is this something that you go back and fix into it later? How do you how do you think about that earning of that emotional moment? I think it's a little of both. So it's definitely something that's in my mind when I'm drafting the story and the arcs of the characters. The emotional moments tend to come at sort of you know a peak uh, or a trough of, of their arc. Mm -hmm. And so it's already baked into where the plot has taken them. But definitely in revisions, I will go back and that's one of the things I'll hold in my head and intentionally look for to say, does this moment come too quickly? Um, does it feel too heightened? Do I need to have more body in the development of, you know, this sub arc over here for those emotions to feel more real and authentic? Um, or does the scene go on too long? Or what comes before and after that scene? Um, because I do think there's a bit of a rhythm to stories and, you know, there needs to be kind of a, a moment of quietness and maybe some action and then some conversation and so on it just needs to kind of feel right because if you just go from peak to peak to peak from an emotional sense then all of those things end up feeling dulled instead of having the actual impact that you want them to have um so yeah definitely something I will go back and in the teller of small fortunes that was something that I do think I had to kind of refine in in edits um some of the emotional moments because they'd been in my head from the very early origins of the story Again, I rushed to get there. And so mm -hmm. needing to go back and take your time along the way um, was something that I needed to, to fix. Well, you're, you are so good at it. And this is another, if, 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 listeners know, I don't, I do not push books like I'm pushing this one like this. Um, but it's, there's so much to learn from you in doing this. And I'm just remembering, no spoilers, a point mm -hmm. at the end of the book where I actually got emotional I'm, and I'm kind of made of stone when I read. I read, like I feel the emotions, but I don't laugh out loud. I don't cry. It's just mm -hmm. like, it's all in here. I got tears in my eyes at oh. this one point. And I was like this. And to me, this is like another person would be sobbing. But I remember <laughs> getting tears in my eyes just from the way that you, and I think that's exactly what you do is you present the emotion and it is not over the top. It's not sentimental. It's not gooey. It's earned. It's there because this character feels deeply and has gone through something and has brought the reader with them. So well freaking done in doing that. Thank you. <laughs> um, what is the kindest thing that you've ever done for yourself as a writer? Yeah. I mean, there are small ones. Like I buy myself the fancy tea now because I count it as like a writing supply, right? Hell yes. Um, uh -huh. But I think the biggest one is I gave myself the gift of a year, a whole year. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, so I, I mentioned I wrote The Teller of Small Fortunes after quitting my job when my dad was ill. And so there were other reasons for that. But I, I did end up going back to a full-time job after The Teller of Small, small excuse me, after The Teller of Small Fortunes had been drafted. Um that job ended up being extraordinarily stressful, um, mm. as honestly most of my jobs have been. But this one was, um, I was you know, running finance and strategy at a startup and things were challenging. Yeah. And um, and at a certain point, I, I was asking myself, you know, why am I doing this? Wouldn't this be so much nicer if I could kind of just sit at home writing stories again and spending time with my family and my dog? Um, and so, you know, I sat down and talked with my partner and we were like, you know what? Well, I, I did get an advance for um, The Teller of Small mm -hmm. Fortunes in the second book as well. And one way of thinking about it, potentially not a super financially responsible way of thinking about it, but one way of thinking about it is that, hey, this money is money that you weren't expecting to get otherwise. Yep. And so what if you view this as you have bought yourself some time to take a break and write more books? And so that's what I did. I, I left that most recent stressful job at the start of this year. And I said, I'm giving myself a year because that seems like a nice 
you know, long, um, indulgent stretch of time, also enough time to write another book for the second book of my contract. Um, it was also a time for, you know, us to go on our honeymoon this year. And so it ended up being just an incredible gift because, you know, it's, it's a very rare opportunity, especially, you know, I'm not retiring necessarily. I'm just taking a break from everyday life and the stressors of it to focus on this thing that I love in a way that I never would have before to enjoy my debut year also, which, you know, as mentioned before, has all kinds of feelings wrapped up in it. Um, but it's, it's been a fantastic year. I recognize it's coming to an end, which makes me a little bit sad, but also I feel recharged in a really great way. Um, and yeah, I think that was, that was a huge gift, just taking myself seriously as an author and saying, Hey, you have earned, you know, a bit of a break and you, you can do this full time and not have it feel like you're just wasting time on something. Yes. Adult. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a job. It. You yeah. allowed yourself to take this job seriously. So it wasn't an indulgence of like, you're just going to sit around and, and, right. you know, drink tea and look longingly into the clouds. You were working <laughs> your ass off at a different job, this job, and you gave yourself the gift of that. And I just think that that is gorgeous and important and really, really, really worthwhile. Okay. So yeah, I don't regret it in the least. And I think a lot of the credit for it, I'm very grateful. Actually, my partner is, was the one encouraging me to do this mm -hmm. when I didn't even really contemplate it as a serious option. Yeah. So having that kind of support is really helpful. That's it. It's essential because like you could have thought of that and then nah, you know, squashed it. Got to yeah. do, got to do the thing. So right. yeah, well done. That's a beautiful, beautiful answer. Can you tell us about a specific moment when you knew that you had ink in your veins? Yes. Um, I mean, so The Teller of Small Fortunes was the first time I'd ever really tried to write a long form thing. But I think it's because as an adult, I never really felt like I had that time and space to pursue this, you know, really serious, intense, creative thing on the side. And if not for my dad getting ill and me quitting my job, I probably never would have. But my entire life, I've always loved reading and writing. It was always my favorite class in school. And I think one memory where I'm like, you know, I probably should have figured this out earlier and, you know, tried something is... Um, I used to play piano when I was younger and I would practice piano in the piano room, you know, our, our library, our office, whatever. And my mom would be in the kitchen or my dad would be in the living room. And so now, now that of them could see me practicing piano, even though I was supposed to be practicing piano. And so I would have a book wedged under my leg on the piano bench. <laughs> and I learned secretly how to play a bunch of songs that were supposed to be played with two hands. I played them with one hand, not very well while reading and flipping the pages of the book on the piano bench underneath my leg. And I got away with this for quite a while. Um, well, they knew you needed to practice. They're like, sounds, sounds kind of, yeah, sounds sounds kind of sloppy rough, with just right? one. <laughs> uh, um, but I think my mom did catch me at one point and then, you know, I had to buckle down and separate my reading from my piano and she would keep a closer eye. But yeah, those early days, I would I would spend as much time as I could reading books, even when I wasn't supposed to be. And then late at night, I would kind of lie there awake, making up continuations of these stories that I was reading in the books in my head. And little did I know, I was just, you know, basically writing fan fiction in my head um, without actually yeah. writing it down. So I, I probably should have known earlier. <laughs> but now you do. Isn't yeah. it wonderful, though, because I, I still feel the same way. And this just happened to me last night. I was falling asleep and I just didn't want to fall asleep because of the book I'm reading. And then in my head, I thought oh, but if I fall asleep, then tomorrow will come and then tomorrow I get to read some more. And yeah, I still think that way all the time. And I have built yeah. in now uh, an hour in my morning. Again, it's an indulgent, um, privileged place to be, but an hour in my mm -hmm. morning after I have breakfast, before I start writing, I read. And That's I just lovely. curl up on my reading. I have a reading couch in my office oh, and it's just amazing. for reading. And it's And it's such an amazing, that's a part of our job. That's part of the ink being in our veins is being readers to our core always yeah. so that's oh. such a perfect morning ritual i want a reading couch where do i get a reading couch i think you should get one it's great especially <laughs> and it's really not comfortable for like more than one person to sit on because it's also a pull out mm -hmm. couch bed thing um but yeah it's great it's just all mine all mine and the dogs i, I share the space with the dog of course can you please tell us about the best book that you have read recently and why did you love it Yes. So this is hard. There are a lot of books that I've read recently that are yep. amazing, but um, assuming I can narrow it down to just one. Um, the City in Glass by Nvi Nhi Vo, um, who wrote the Singing Hills novellas, which are also amazing books, by the way. So The City in Glass, it just came out and it is 
such a strange book in the best possible way. It is ostensibly a fantasy. It's a standalone, um, but it's so many things at once. It's sort of this portrait in time of a city, a fantasy city, over centuries as it gets destroyed and then rebuilt again. And it's being rebuilt by a demon, this semi-immortal creature. It's also a love story between said demon and like a fallen angel. But again, over the course of centuries, they like go decades without seeing each other again. And then, you know, he shows up and angel demon things happen. And then it's also this really profound meditation on grief and belonging and, and loss and memory. And it was just such a beautiful individual piece of work. It's perfect, you know, has exactly everything it needs to have and not an inch more. And Nevo's prose is just one of the one of the most beautiful, I think, examples of, of modern fantasy prose that there is. So it was really such a good book. Like I put it down and I just had to go, oh, it's one of those books that makes you want to keep writing. Yes. So you can get better and, you know, one day aspire to that level of good, you know. That is the best kind of reading for me is when I actually, especially when I've been bummed out or stressed out mm -hmm. about something I'm writing and you go away and you read and you have to close the book because it's so inspiring. And then you go back to your work. Mm -hmm. That is fabulous. And I have never heard of this book and I'm putting it on my list. I also feel like I should put you on my email list of people that I reach out to when I'm like, I don't I need a book. Give me a book. Oh, please because do. obviously have... we have the, the same kind of reading sensibility and... Fantastic. Great. Putting you putting you in my pocket that way. Please can do. You... I, I love giving book recommendations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please tell us about The Teller of Small Fortunes? Oh, yes. Um, The Teller of Small Fortunes, which I handily, I actually just got my box of finished copies yesterday. After it's, some look at the, I mean, I know that most people listen to this on the podcast, but it uh -huh. let's describe what we're seeing. It is a, it's so colorful. It's a night scene of a woman on her, um, I can't even traveling for wagon. It. Tra traveling wagon yeah. looking into a dark blue night sky it is but lit up with the oh it's just gorgeous there's also a cat yeah, the cat is on the it's my favorite part yeah Devin Elkerts the artist did such a fantastic job mm. with the cover I just want to live in it um so the teller of small fortunes is a uh, cozy fantasy novel or cozy adjacent it really depends on the definition but it's about Tao, an immigrant fortune teller who lives a fairly lonely life at the start of the story. She's traveling around from village to village telling small fortunes because the big fortunes are just nobody wants that. Um, I mean, right like, there, you had me right there, right? Like right there when I read that in the log line, mm -hmm. on, you know, in, from your publicist, I was like, that's what I want to read. I want to read about small fortunes because I, well, I could do origin. that. I'd only want to do small fortunes. Screw the big fortunes. Everybody will be mad. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but the title was the the first thing that I wrote down, actually, in the, the core wow. concept. You know, it's just like, you know, like I've, I've read a lot of epic prophecies and so on. But what if somebody's just kind of over all of that? I only wants to do the little ones. And um, the title never makes it through. The title, I'm going to say 97% yeah. of the time doesn't make it through, but yours not only made it through, but it was the concept. I was okay, so sorry, nervous please go about on. it. Yeah, no, I, I so thought good. my agent would kill it. I thought my editor would kill it. But everyone who read the title was like, yeah, we love the title. We're keeping the title. And I was like, yes, thank you. Uh, sorry. That's bit of so a, good. Um, so yeah, Tao is an immigrant fortune teller. She tells these small fortunes. She tells the wrong fortune, or perhaps the right one, uh, to a retired mercenary and a thief that she meets on the road and gets uh, unwittingly roped into their search for the mercenary's lost daughter. Um, it's a found family story. They meet some other companions along the way, including a slightly magical cat, which is featured prominently in the marketing because everybody loves cats. Everybody loves uh, cats, yep. And um, she's also kind of on the run from secrets of her past and the reality of her powers. How, not the cat. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Um, and ultimately, she has to make a choice between kind of preserving the life that she's worked really hard to build for herself and the freedom over this newfound family that she has developed around her. And found family will always be one of my core stories that I will. It's just like mine too. No, oh, that's all I that's all I want to read. Yeah. I'm so excited that this is coming out. I'm actually going to cue it to come out the week of the election, um, so mm -hmm. that people can hear that and and hopefully they'll say we get to celebrate by going to buy this book. And so it'll come oh, out that dear. Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Everything crossed. I and where can we find you out there? Oh, online. yes. Um, other than in San Francisco, wandering the streets. Um, <laughs> I am on Instagram at, at Julie Leong Books, and I welcome any cat or dog or otherwise photos that you would like to send me of your of your fluffy pets. 
I'm also on the website formerly known as Twitter, although we'll see for how long that lasts. Same username, Julie Leong Books. Or my website is www.julieleong.com. Thank you very much. I am enjoying Blue Sky, I have to say. Oh, oh yes, I'm also there. Yeah, okay. It took me, it took me, I got off Twitter a couple years ago and I'm only now, and I got on Blue Sky then and then I never used Mm -hmm. it, but I'm starting to use it again and I'm, I'm enjoying it. I think There's I just no... don't understand how any of the social media really works. I like Instagram. Instagram, I can do everything else. Yeah. I exist there, but I'm not entirely sure I'm using the, it right. So. The thing I like about it is that there's no real algorithm. You're only going to see who you follow. Huh. And that's what's confusing people. They're like, well, how do I find stuff? I'm like, well, you kind of have to go out and look at it. Look huh. for people. And then- Well, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of nice. nice. Yeah. It is. I'm kind of building it brick by brick. Yeah. Well, I'm going to find yeah. you there. Thank oh, you thank so you. much for being on the show. This was an absolute delight. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun.